Now, when I'm playing my tiefling, I was told by the dungeon master that tieflings were not exactly welcome in some major cities, but I could still play one, which I decided to do since, hey, seeing what the party could do working with someone normally hated, that's cool. Big mistake number two. We start in the capital city, my character looking for a long lost friend who saved them from a manhunt. Everyone else starts in a guild hall, but I'm sneaking through alleyways. Okay, fine enough, but the problems arise when I'm asked to make a stealth check. My dexterity wasn't amazing since I was using point buy and wanted higher wisdom and constitution. I later on realized that the DM let the other players use a modified standard array where the lowest stat was 14. Anyway, I fail with an 18 at level 4 and several magical and non-magical alarms go off. So I'm now being chased by a dozen guards who corner me and absolutely light me up with their muskets. DM says I'm down but not dead, and I get taken prisoner and the party is told to keep an eye on me while I earn some worth in society, presumably by helping them with their quest. Whatever it was, I wasn't told about it since they went into another room because I wasn't in the building where they were given the quest. One of the other players, Caden, immediately says something along the lines of, I start yanking them around by their chains, and that is how things would go for a significant portion of the game. My character getting literally dragged around. This was sent to me after our tiefling video, and yeah, look, I get it. Some people want there to be extreme consequences for playing certain D&D races, but if you're gonna have it be this extreme, then maybe question why you're letting the player pick the race at all. And, you know, while you're at it, maybe be a bit more specific about what the player is going to be experiencing, because this, this is a bit beyond what most people would expect. Basically, I DM at a game store where we do weekly one-shots. I am one of the more consistent dungeon masters, and after the store canceled our game sessions for two weeks, the next time we ran sessions, I actually got to play for the first time in over a month. I was telling the other dungeon masters how excited I was to be able to play one of either two characters I had made. One of them, who was in the DM in the story, kept joking about how he was going to kill my character? So, we're playing a module that was written for 11th level characters, but for some reason, the DMs, plural, set the player's level at 9 with no magical items. After about an hour and a half of making our way to the fortress, we enter our very first combat. Even with alert feet rolls, I roll an 11 for initiative, so I'm near the bottom. A creature made an attack against me that made me fall prone without a save, and then the DM targets my player with a death ray from a beholder, which I fail and instantly disintegrates me before I even get a turn. Okay, it was kind of funny, but we've never really had any player character deaths before. I already had another sheet ready though, and that character entered combat when it actually came to my original character's first turn, so that was fine. Okay, as Blorkin so the Blorgon hits the ground, Bleegons and a Blorkin comes into the scene. You have a brand new character. Look, I don't want to make any claims about your DMing, but this is the fifth player character death. And I'm starting to think our characters are really valued. What? Oh, no, 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 no. I care about your characters a lot. This is gonna be a game where characters have arcs and stories where you guys are gonna be able to build the tales of these heroes for years to come. Uh, that's why I'm throwing five red dragons at you. Are you kidding me? What? No! After being forced to flee combat because we were definitely not set up to fight these kind of creatures at our party level and party size, we make it to some room where we're supposed to be investigating some magic artifact. All our arcana rules do is validate that there's some sort of magical wall or secret passageway in the room, so my character goes up to it, and I trip a glyph of warding with a disintegrate spell that instantly kills me. Again. While it was my choice to investigate the wall, we did literally make an arcana check, and all we got from a 15 result was that it was magical. The dungeon master did not warn me out of game 
that maybe we should possibly be careful about approaching this, considering she literally just killed my other character. There was no hints at all that there was going to be a literal instant death trap. I'm a DM, and I have no problem with player deaths, but I also know how to run my game in a way that isn't just crapping on a single person because it feels bad. I ended up making a third character that she said she was going to introduce, but for the last hour of the session, I literally just sat there and my third character never got introduced at all. Cool. Oh, and by the way, the DM in the story is running her last session this week. I plan on making a Gloomstalker rogue assassin just to cheese her encounters this week, so that if I die, I at least get to nuke something's health before that. To be honest, I think that's totally fair given what she did last week. And I hate the Gloom Assassin archetype, it's lame, but if I'm going to potentially die before my first turn, you know for a fact I'm going to try, try, to get at least a kill or two in. Something, something, in-game solutions, something, something, other game problems. Look, I do recommend talking to the DM about how your characters have been dying. Maybe she thinks that she's entirely justified. I don't know. Maybe she can be convinced. You can't know until you at least have a conversation about it. But at the same time, this seems to be more of a beer and pretzels, lower rent game. You know, just for the combat, just one shot, that kind of thing. I still think you should have that conversation. But at the end of the day, this person's in-game solution is just making an optimized character, which, I mean, a lot of people just do anyway. So yeah, I think it's reasonable here, but just, you know, for the record, if you encounter a similar problem, talk to the DM, because an optimized character is probably not going to save you. First off, the characters. The Dungeon Master. Honestly, fairly passive. I don't know how much experience he had, but the fact that he pretty much let the party do whatever, and it was a high school game, well, it makes me think not much of it. Me was a first time player, playing an Aarakocra Cleric, Life Domain, since the party needed a healer. Definitely not necessarily right for the story, but I feel like it's excusable since I grew up from my mistakes. Pyro, the player I had an issue with, a chaotic, neutral, evocation wizard lizard folk who was a bit of a sadist. Didn't really know him outside the game, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and assume it was just the character. Heavy, because I guess we're going with Team Fortress 2 names. He wasn't there until my third session, but played along with Pyro shenanigans and made them worse. Other characters include the Divination Wizard, who was new, joining during my second session, we'll call her Scout, and a fighter and paladin who weren't really involved in the problem, so they'll just be referred to by their, like, class names. Anyway, the session I initially joined was basically just travel, and the DM really setting up in a city that we needed to be in, basically just to clear out a dungeon and then go somewhere else. It was my first session ever, so I was basically just sitting back and seeing what to do, and Pyro didn't have any opportunities to be chaotic yet, so I'll skip to the second session where the dungeon and the problems started. The first problem happened when we were heading down to the second floor of the dungeon. While the rest of the party was ready to just go down, Pyro said, No, watch this, and proceeded to dump a couple of bottles of oil down the hole, then cast a fire damage cantrip on them, and simply shut the trap door so they couldn't get out. The DM described the screams slowly dying out, and only then did Pyro actually let us go down. I figured that as a good aligned life cleric, and also a bird race, which means he presumably would value, like, freedom and stuff. I felt like I wasn't in particularly in favor of trapping people in a burning room with no chance to fight back. Now, I was an edgy teen, so when we went down, I basically just sulked in the corner for a bit while him and Fighter cleared out the remaining goblins. I believe my exact words were, I spend my turn glaring at Pyro. I should have been more direct that I didn't like that because while that was the only instance in that session, the next session, he would be much more problematic. One more important thing to note about the second session, since it led into the third, is that right at the end, we had beat the boss of the dungeon, who had a throne of skulls. We thought it was cool, and wanted to bring it with us as a prize. So, a couple of strength checks later, and we were carrying Scout along in the throne, since they were pretty charismatic both in-game and IRL, so they quickly became the party's favorite member. Anyway, Start of the third session, our celebrations for having helped the town clear out their dungeon are cut short as Heavy comes in. A bit of banter later and the party is back outside. Some small in-character arguments happen or something and results in Pyro casting Shatter on our Skull Throne. With Scout currently still, you know, 
sitting in it. Luckily, they succeeded the saving throw because we were level 3 or 4 and they were a wizard, so they could have easily just died outright if the dice chose it. A couple of rounds of player versus player combat ensued, but no one was badly hurt enough that me or the paladin couldn't just quickly patch them up, and we were about to rest anyways. Later that session, near the end, was when the thing that made me decide that Pyro and my character could not exist in the same party happened. We were traveling to a different city, when a lone cultist approached our cart and was easily captured. Pyro and Heavy were attempting to torture them for information, and I asked if I would be able to hear. My passive perception was pretty high as a cleric, so the DM said, yeah, I could. I went in, told them to stop, and cast Charm Person or something, and had them tell us the information, and gave the two something along the lines of, see, there's much better ways to do an interrogation. Well, a bit later, a note gets passed, and the DM says we hear a scream from the woods, and Pyro coming back from that direction. I asked him what happened, and he said, Oh, I took them out because they weren't useful anymore. And that was it. That line, despite my attempts to make his character a bit more ethical in his methods so mine could actually get along with him, made me decide that, yeah, I can't play this character with his in the party, so I broke the most important rule and initiated player versus player. And, well... It was a disaster. He used a wand of shape earth to trap me in a dome with Heavy, who I was right next to, unfortunately. He grappled me, and the terrible luck that plagues most of my characters meant that I couldn't break free, so he just knocked me down in a grapple, then decided not to kill my character, instead just putting them out of commission. The story does have a happy ending though, as during the next and sadly last session we played due to the pandemic, I played an ASMR bard that aside from a rocky start with the paladin due to me not remembering that they were a tiefling, I got along pretty well with the rest of the party and due to a combination of being my only player character so far to have been lucky and the dungeon we were going into encouraging non-lethal takedowns, which my bard was great for since I had both hideous laughter and sleep to use, on top of a clutch moment with me crown of madnessing one of the cultists to destroy the anchors of a spell circle they were using for a ritual, it was much more fun than the previous sessions of me trying to keep the party in line. Since then, I've also learned that you should always be clear with someone when you have a problem with their character and try to work it out between you instead of just trying to imply it through your character. So don't worry. While I haven't run into any more players I couldn't get along with in character since then, I'll be sure to deal with the situation better when it inevitably rises again. Hey, look at that. Somebody taking my lessons to heart. I love to see that kind of thing. Now, I would go on the whole spiel of you can't solve out game problems with in-game consequences, but this person, and I'm sure all of you at this point, get that. Now, obviously Pyro is a little bit edgy, and I think that Heavy was joining them in that case. But if the party and the DM are okay with it, then that's the vibe the game is going. You can't stand against the wall, so to speak. Of course, you should communicate what makes you comfortable and communicate your desires just like how they would communicate their desires, but at the end of the day, you gotta respect that majority in some way, and if it's not a group that you're vibing with, that's all good. There's nothing wrong with you deciding to move on and find a different group that fits your needs better. Like this person said at the end, not a lot of people find joy in policing their D&D group, both the people being policed and the people doing the policing. It's important to both communicate your needs, but also find a group that suits those needs as well. I'm honestly just really glad this person managed to learn, seemingly, both those lessons. Been a long time fan of the series, thanks. There's only one really important character, and we'll call them Perry. Now let's get into the horror story. This is my first time doing this, so sorry if it happens to be formatted oddly. So this horror story starts when we're playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition with my first campaign ever. One of my high school friends invited me to join, and I asked if I could invite my partner, now X, Perry, who claimed they played Dungeons & Dragons before. I did this since we were still low on players. I think it was just me and my friend before this. Now, there were immediate problems with Perry. First one that isn't so bad. They hated roleplay and would complain about one of the group's pacifist characters because this is a combat game. Why are you not fighting? 
Additionally, it took them weeks, if not months, to get their character sheet ready. I say months because we figured out that they were just going off what they thought or remembered their character could do. And finally, they made the lovely decision to choose a race that didn't even exist yet without the Dungeon Master's permission. I obviously wasn't perfect either, as this was my first game too. I made common mistakes, such as not having a backstory that made sense and playing a slightly chaotic stupid character. Thankfully, I remedied these. Unthankfully, Perry remedied none of their problems. Now, on to the campaign. We started by having to make it to a new country, and to do that, we would need to travel through an Arachni cave. Now, this cave was practically an entire civilization of Arachni, with their own king. We were eventually brought in to meet the king, and I think the reason was asking for passage. Upon meeting this Arachni king, Perry decides they want to roll to seduce him? Now, an important piece of information is that our dungeon master at the time was a very chill, as long as you get to where you need type of person, which wasn't bad, but I hated it in this case. The DM states that Perry would need a nat 20 charisma roll, and you guessed it, Perry rolls a nat 20, so we fade to black, thank the gods, and I believe that is where we end the session. Okay, what does Narachni look like? Oh. Well, I'm sure there's at least one Alo that's into this stuff. Now this, this was harmless. If not perhaps a weird interaction, it would be fine. But there were other important things to mention. Firstly, the race Perry chose was an insectile species. I'm pretty sure it was a moth. And they expected the dungeon master to let them have babies with the Arachni King. This will be important later. And secondly, they tried to do this again in later sessions. Now, a few sessions pass and everything goes okay, other than the fact that Perry is abysmal at tracking and combat and what they can do. Weird, if only they had some kind of sheet for that. And also, the dungeon master tells Perry to roll a d20 and that the eggs will hatch in that many days. Perry rolls another 20 on the dice bot and DM rules that it'll be 20 days before they'll hatch. This unfortunately meant that Perry would ask at the end of every session if it's been 20 days yet. Now, my biggest issue. When Perry finally gets their way, they try to convince the Dungeon Master to let their clutch of, like, 30 demons spawn to be able to participate in combat. Thankfully, the DM vetoed this. However, this was met with Perry exclaiming, But, but that's what I made the character for! Yeah, you heard me. Perry made an insect character simply for the reason that they'd have a ton of children to use in combat. Another minor issue that came to a head later is that I was planning with the dungeon master to retire my character, having them become a small bad evil guy or something like that. I did this because like I said, my character was kind of all over the place backstory wise, so this would tie all the loose ends together and stop any further complications. Myself and the dungeon master decided my character would find out his druidic mentor died and would go on a quest to revive her, making sure no one stopped him and doing some pretty dark rituals to do it. Now, my character found this out in a different country by a shapeshifter homebrew monster the DM made that transforms into its most recent victim. In this case, my character and the party were fighting what looked to be his mentor. Perry attacked first and lit the monster on fire with a homebrew attack, I'm pretty sure. When it got around to my character's turn, I asked the DM, do I know this isn't actually my mentor? And the DM had me make a wisdom save, which I failed. It should have been insider perception, but all right. Anyway, my character decided to put out the monster by conjuring some water above it. This made Perry sulk throughout the entirety of combat. It made fun of what I thought was an interesting character moment, making it unfilling and just not fun. There were some minor things I didn't mention, but overall, Perry was just exhausting to play with and made the campaign a slog. Man, I'm glad this writer broke up with the problem player. Hey, look, I remembered they dated. Hmm? See, I'm improving. But yeah, some of this person's behavior is framed as not that bad, but it's pretty bad. That seduction scene could be really uncomfortable to watch. It's just sometimes not great to watch people flirt without any sort of, you know, prior heads up. It just makes the dungeon master uncomfortable. It can make the observers uncomfortable. So that's not great at a base. The desire to use a bunch of demon babies in combat is obviously an extreme and ridiculous want from this player. I mean, God, I guarantee you they would want the DM to put 30 extra tokens on the map, which, yeah, as a dungeon master, God, that kind of thing is so annoying. On top of all that, not making a character sheet 
for months? I mean, if somebody did that in my games, I would consider a kick because come on, if I'm doing all this work to prep the campaign and you can't even get your character sheet in order, I'm sorry, I don't even know why I keep you around. Not the worst one we've ever seen, but certainly one of the more annoying ones. I started a new game with one player from an old campaign and three new players I had not played with before. Two of the new ones had never played before while one of them, the problem player, said all her previous games ended so soon. I was happy to help them set up. I helped them with their backstories to make it fit into the world I was planning. Everyone was fine, except Mary, who sent me a really long backstory, which basically was her character being the chosen one and having killed a dragon before. I told her it didn't make sense as they were starting from level one, so she sent me another story about how the chosen one was cursed by her jealous stepbrother and lost all her powers. I tweaked the story a lot while talking with her, making it so she wasn't something so overpowered as I didn't know how to make it work in game with normal leveling up. She wasn't happy about the changes, but agreed. I had made a group where they could all talk and Mary was happy that there was another girl at the group besides her. After a while, I had talked with her about her character. Mary sent me a message that she and the other girl talked and decided to change their backstories a bit. The new story had no change in Mary's character, while the other girl was basically her hype man and the one who recorded Mary's epic adventures. I asked the girl, and she was clearly not pleased with the story and had not agreed to the story either, but Mary had assured her by saying, let's see, as she agreed. I probably should have kicked her out right there, but I didn't. Our first session went actually well, besides Mary wasting no time and telling everyone how awesome her character was and how much stronger she was than everyone else. She was level 1, just like everyone else. It was a bit annoying, but it wasn't anything too major. In the second session, I had them meet a guildmaster, a guy who was a national hero, and he appointed them as a party with one of his students so she could learn how to be an adventurer. I sort of planned her to be one of those DMPCs who would level up alongside them, and they would keep meeting early on. The party liked her. Then Mary insulted the guildmaster, saying he was most likely a fraud? Now for the NPC that was with them, I decided that she would look up to the guildmaster as he had saved her village when she was a child, and he was now her mentor. So the NPC asked her to take back what she said. Mary did not like this at all. She completely out of character started telling me, the DM, how I had instantly ruined a good female character by making her only personality be that she likes a guy? I told her that wasn't the case, that the character had a lot more personality, and looking up to that guy was part of her character, and not the entirety of it. A lot of people think like that, and it is the most annoying thing. Oh yeah, man, I just got this new Lego set. This thing looks awesome! I'm so hyped for the build. <laughs> is building Legos your whole personality? Honestly, that is so ridiculous. <laughs> Oh my god, are you prepping Dungeons and Dragons again? What, is it your whole personality? Oh my god, are you doing the dishes? Is chores your whole personality? The others also joined in, telling Mary she was being rude and she needed to stop this arguing. She kept arguing and also started crying, leaving the group and the call. She sent a message to that other girl that she should leave as well because this group was clearly misogynistic and she would regret staying. The other girl told us that she has a friend who can join us, so now I have four players again and the game was infinitely better. I'm sure I covered the whole personality thing in a skit that I totally remembered the film, but in any case, the main problem here to me is just over analyzing behavior and being way too up your own bum for a lack of a better phrase. On this channel, I encourage people to look out for red flags, obviously. I don't want you to waste your time at a group that's not going to be fun for you. But some people take this way, 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 way too far. And this is one of those examples. Saying the NPC is a misogynist red flag is obviously stupid, but Mary herself is showing a lot of other red flags herself, mainly the main character syndrome, which, by the way, is probably why she was really freaking out about this NPC, because remember, the NPC argued and disagreed with Mary, and she got pissy over it. Not only should you be self-aware about your own behavior, but also don't overanalyze the behavior of others. Obviously, keep an eye out for red flags, but don't look too deep into finding the bad because you're going to miss out on all the good. And that's going to be it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories.
If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Tavern Jason podcast, where we talk all things TTRPGs, while also doing a campaign diary for my new D&D campaign. Very exciting. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. We're not your hype men. So let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, there is an email in the description. Send them our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, and that's just like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.